Chelsea Withby, the tall blonde woman, surrounded by friends and family, walked into court. This case started on the 10th of June 2020 after her son, 18 month old Emerson, died of blunt force trauma to the head. Withby was charged with manslaughter and stood trial. Welcome or welcome back. I'm Cassie and this is A Wicked World. Before we get into today's video, I just wanted to let you know that I just opened up a merchandise store for A Wicked World. There's hoodies, beanies, wine glasses, stickers, and more. So go check it out. The link is in the description box below. So the story I have for you today is one about a little boy who never got proper justice, even though it was pretty clear that his injuries were not accidental. But how did they really happen? Let me know what you think at the end of this video. This is the story of Emerson Whitby. Emerson William Brian Whitby was born on December 2nd, 2018 to his mother, Chelsea Whitby, and his father, Riley Jolly. He was affectionately called Bug or Buggy, and Emerson was said to be vibrant, adventurous, and busy. He was always on the move and was also a very loving child. His grandmother described him as always smiling and said that Emerson brought so much sunshine to their home. Emerson's parents, Chelsea and Riley, had actually ended their relationship prior to Emerson's birth. But they had an informal custody agreement where Emerson would spend one or two days a week with his father as well as every other weekend. At the beginning of 2020, Chelsea began dating a father of two who was named Taylor Stewart. Shortly after, he, along with his two daughters, would move in with Chelsea and Emerson in their Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada apartment. By mid-April of 2020, Emerson's father, Riley, began to notice unexplained bruises on his son's ribs. So, he started documenting the injuries. Then, in the weeks following, the father also began to notice more bruises, this time on Emerson's ear, cheek, and eye, as well as a bald spot on the top of his head. Emerson's mother, Chelsea, offered explanations for some of these injuries, but not for others. Prior to this, she would always tell Riley whenever their son had any type of injury, so he thought it was odd that this time he had to go to her and ask about them. And only a month later, on May 26, 2020, Riley again went to pick up his son from his mother's house. When he noticed that Emerson had two very swollen, very black eyes. Chelsea just informed him that Emerson had fallen out of his crib. The father was, of course, in shock, but he didn't know what to do. So he brought his son Emerson with him to his mother's work and asked her. Riley's mother, Emerson's grandmother, Darla Jolly, took photos of her grandson's injuries and told Riley to bring him to his pediatrician to get checked out. So following that, Riley took his son to the doctor's office and the doctor would inform him that if the swelling became any worse, he should take the toddler to the hospital. But later that same day, when Riley realized that the bruises were getting worse, he called up Chelsea and told her that they needed to bring Emerson to the hospital. However, they would argue back and forth about it because Chelsea did not see the need for him to go to the hospital, as she said that black eyes always get worse before they get better. So, because of this, Riley did not take his son to the hospital, because he was worried that if he did, Chelsea would try to keep his son from him. Riley did, however, contact the Ministry of Social Services, and he provided them with the pictures of Emerson's injuries. An investigation was then launched, and police went to Chelsea's home to speak with her. When they arrived, she was outside in the parking lot, crying to her boyfriend, Taylor. They also noticed that the bruising on Emerson's face was very apparent. After police spoke with the mother, Emerson was taken to the hospital for a medical evaluation and, as the police investigation continued, Emerson was placed into the care of his grandmother, Lisa Virtue, Chelsea's mother. However, the little boy would be returned to his mother's care just days later, on June 3rd. Though, Chelsea was still required to check in with her own mother every day. Chelsea had explained to authorities during their inquiry that she hadn't taken Emerson to the hospital because she was fearful of COVID-19. 
She also claimed that his black eyes and the other bruising on his body were just from him learning how to walk. He's a rammy kid, she said, and noted he often ran into things. She also claimed that he bruised very easily, so she was unsure if he had an iron deficiency, which is a reason why you would bring him to the doctor to get that checked out. Apparently, the only injury that Chelsea could not explain was a healing rib fracture that the doctors had discovered when Emerson had been brought into the hospital. Though she guessed that it was caused by an earlier fall from some exterior steps at her mother's house. So less than a week after Emerson had been back in his mother's custody, on June 9th, 2020, Riley went to again pick up his son for a visit. When Riley picked him up, he said that Emerson seemed very cranky and whiny on the ride back home, though this was normally how the little boy got when he was hungry, so he didn't think much of it. Emerson had then spent much of the day with his father Riley and Riley's mother, Darla Jolly, and according to both of them, the little boy was acting like his normal self and full of energy for much of the afternoon. But then later that day, Emerson suddenly seemed to lose all of his energy, cried before his afternoon nap, and didn't want to have his bath, which was highly unusual for the toddler. That evening, Riley brought his son back to Chelsea's home around 8.30 p.m. And when he did, Emerson suddenly started vomiting. Riley would help her clean up the mess before then leaving. And when he did, Chelsea called her mother Lisa over to help her get Emerson down to bed for the night. But then, the next morning around 10 a.m., Chelsea would wake up to find her son Emerson limp and unresponsive in his crib. And when first responders arrived at the apartment on the 3200 block of Arons Road East, they were able to restart the little boy's heart. However, once they arrived at the Regina General Hospital, it would be determined that little Emerson was brain dead. On the drive to the hospital, first responders noted that Chelsea and her family were wondering to themselves if Emerson had died from SIDS, and they were questioning whether or not he had been sleeping on his back. But Emerson was 18 months old, so he could clearly roll from his front to his back, not to mention that SIDS is almost always seen in children 12 months and younger. When Emerson had arrived at the hospital, he was found to have about 20 different bruises covering his body. His cause of death would be determined to be from a large subdural cranial hemorrhage that was caused by a significant blunt force trauma to his head. It was concluded that trauma to his brain had been the result of a non-accidental or potentially physically abusive action with considerable force. The radiologist at the hospital where Emerson had been taken also said that the child's head showed excessive swelling and significant hemorrhage or bleeding across the entire right side of his head. This large bleed had occurred not more than a day before the actual injury. There was also evidence that a similar bleed had occurred in the same area, possibly a month or two prior. A doctor at the hospital that day would also tell Emerson's parents that the little boy's injuries could not have been self-inflicted. Chelsea Whitby wouldn't end up being charged in her son's death until nearly two months after he died, on August 5th, 2020. She had, however, hired a lawyer before she was even a suspect in her son's death, and police told the mother that this was very odd behavior for someone who wasn't accused of doing anything wrong. But Chelsea just said that she had sought legal help because her mother had told her to because they were scared. Apparently, police had told Chelsea initially that they believed her son's death had been caused by somebody outside of the home. But according to them, Chelsea had little interest in finding out exactly who that was. Instead, they claimed that she was more focused on the growing attention from police and making sure that her boyfriend Taylor stuck to their story that Emerson had likely injured himself from a rough night's sleep. At this time, Chelsea was handed down the charge of manslaughter. However, this would later be upgraded to second-degree murder. But she maintained that she had no idea what happened to her son and did not know why he was gone because nobody had hurt him. Chelsea's mental health was also called into question during her interview with police, and she would inform them that she had long struggled with anxiety and depression. She was also currently taking antidepressants specifically for postpartum depression. But regardless, she maintained that she'd never hurt Emerson and even told police to give her a lie detector test. However, wouldn't end up taking one at the advice of her lawyer. When police questioned Chelsea about her son's injuries, she would say that the bruising on his sides were likely caused by her boyfriend's daughters playing with him too rough. 
When they asked her about the bald spot on Emerson's head, Chelsea would reiterate back to them what a doctor had told her, which was that it might be alopecia. His ear injury, she explained to police, had happened when he was trying to stand up in the living room, but he stood up too close to an old wooden rocking chair and had hit his head hard. In regards to his facial bruising, Chelsea claimed that Emerson had woken up from his nap in his room alone, and he was peering out the window at kids playing outside, but had accidentally slipped and hit his head on the window crank. Then she explained that the bruising on his eyes had been from him standing up in bed, but when he had, the temporary bed rail had failed, sending him, the rail, and the mattress tumbling to the floor, and he had hit his face on the bed rail on the way down. But there's no way that that would cause two very large, very swollen black eyes. She still claimed that she had no idea where the two rib fractures had come from that social services had discovered during their investigation. Now, Chelsea's boyfriend at the time, Taylor Stewart, had also been under police scrutiny following Emerson's death. He had been interviewed on June 11, 2020, and told police that he had been out running errands the morning that Emerson died. He said that he and his two daughters had woken up at 8.15 that morning. Then they had all left the house around 9.30 because he needed to run to the store to buy some milk and some cigarettes. When he came back to the home at 10.12 a.m., which was confirmed by video surveillance, Chelsea had come running out of the apartment and told him that Emerson wasn't breathing, then handed him the toddler's body. Taylor took Emerson back upstairs to the apartment, where 911 was finally called. And Taylor also began to perform CPR on the toddler until the first responders would arrive. Taylor also recalled that prior to his trip to the store, Chelsea had checked on Emerson on his baby monitor. And it showed that Emerson had rolled over, but they decided to just let him sleep anyways because he had had such a late bedtime the night before due to being sick. I'm not sure if they realized that you can let an 18-month-old sleep on their stomach. Taylor also claimed that he remembered Emerson being sick on the morning of June 9th, the day before he died, though Riley said he was just cranky and didn't seem sick at all that morning. When Taylor was asked about how the discipline in the household was handled, he noted that Emerson did not receive physical redirection, aside from one incident that he had observed. He got a smack on the hand once that I've seen from Chelsea, Taylor said, explaining that the toddler kept trying to investigate a drawer after repeatedly being told no. Police didn't find any inconsistencies in Taylor's story, but would speak to him once more a few days later, as well as ask him to come in for a polygraph test on June 20th, which he agreed to. However, just days prior to his polygraph examination being given, he decided to take himself out of this world. His body would be found in his truck that was parked on a rural road just outside of Regina on the morning of his scheduled polygraph. Taylor also left behind notes for his loved ones in which he claimed he had been struggling with depression for years. He additionally stated that he had never hurt Emerson and did not believe that Chelsea did either. Apparently, just prior to this happening, he had gone to Chelsea's apartment at 4 a.m., and the two had had a conversation outside for about an hour before Taylor again left. Chelsea had no idea that would be the last time she saw him. But the thing is that even after Taylor had taken himself out of this world, Chelsea did not try to put any of the blame on him for Emerson's death. Police had tapped her phone, and they would hear her speaking to a psychic, and she blamed herself for Taylor's death, and also said that she believed that police were now going to try to pin Emerson's death on him. But Chelsea claimed that Taylor would never have hurt Emerson because he, quote, loved Buggy. During another earlier tapped phone call between Chelsea and Taylor, Chelsea was heard telling her boyfriend to not talk to police, and she also told him, no, we're not doing anything, after Taylor informed her that he had agreed to a polygraph. Taylor's story stayed consistent the entire time, and it would stay consistent with what was brought up at trial. Though, it's kind of weird that Emerson did not start to receive any types of injuries until shortly after he had moved into the home. And of course, everyone is likely to question, why did he decide to just take himself out days before he was given a polygraph examination. And according to Emerson's grandmother, Lisa Virtue, the toddler bruised easily from just being a boy. 
So easily, in fact, that she had suggested to Chelsea that she start keeping an accident journal in her home to detail the times that he injured himself. Now, Lisa had also seen Emerson on the night of June 9th. And she would say that she did not remember seeing some of the bruises on his face that he had at the time of his death the day prior. However, she had just assumed that they were the result of life-saving measures being taken. 27-year-old Chelsea Whitby would go to trial in June of 2023. And this trial was actually a voir d'oir, a trial within a trial. Now, the defense's argument was that Emerson had suffered from a previous injury, which had caused a subdural hemorrhage instead of a more recent trauma. A doctor also testified that there was no definite way to tell if the swelling was the result of trauma or cardiac arrest. Their argument was that Emerson's injury was accidental, a re-bleed, and not trauma that had been caused by Chelsea. But even if it was a re-bleed, the trauma would have had to have happened somehow in the first place. So who caused that initial trauma? The prosecution's argument was that Emerson's brain bleed and subsequent cardiac arrest could only have happened in the hour prior to paramedics being called. They said that Chelsea had been in a significant period of frustration with Emerson and claimed that she lashed out physically at him, resulting in the blunt force injury. A man who had dated Chelsea between October of 2018 and April of 2019 was also called forth during the trial to testify. His name was Patrick Earnshaw, and he had frequently stayed in the home with Chelsea and her son Emerson after Emerson was born. He said there was one night when the baby would not stop crying while Chelsea was trying to breastfeed him. Chelsea had then begun to cry out of desperation, and despite the room being dimly lit, Patrick was sure that he saw the mother make a backhanded swat at little Emerson. Though Patrick said this was the only incident that had bothered him in regards to Chelsea's parenting. He also testified that Chelsea was the kind of mom who would bring Emerson to the doctors anytime she had a concern regarding his well-being. But then, he also claimed that while he believed Chelsea enjoyed being a mother, she would get very stressed about very little things. Emerson's father, Riley, would take the stand, and he would testify that the only time he had been concerned about Chelsea's parenting was during an incident in early 2020. Chelsea had been complaining to him about how difficult it was to get Emerson to bed, and she had then taken his head and shoved it into a pillow, then held it there for four to five seconds. However, the little boy did not receive any injuries from that occurrence. Riley also testified that his son was very energetic and quick. He was a daredevil kid, he said. He also said that it was rather alarming when Emerson had puked at Chelsea's house the night prior because Emerson did not often get sick like that. Riley was also questioned on the stand about the differences in Emerson's face compared to what he had seen the day previous. He said that there was a bruise about an inch in diameter on Emerson's forehead that was immediately apparent and had not been there the day before. But at the end of the trial, it would end up being determined that the prosecution's evidence was inadmissible and the judge decided that there were reasonable alternatives for Emerson's death that did not include Chelsea Whippy intentionally harming her son. Therefore, both her charges of second-degree murder and manslaughter were dropped. Bright and early, Chelsea Whitby, the tall, blonde woman, surrounded by friends and family, walked into court. The courtroom was packed. This case started on the 10th of June 2020 after her son, 18-month-old Emerson, died of blunt force trauma to the head. Withby was charged with manslaughter and stood trial. Justice Catherine Dawson wasted no time delivering her judgment. She found the Crown had not proven its case beyond reasonable doubt. The judge based her decision on two things, one of which is after over seven hours interview by experienced police officers, she continued to maintain she was innocent. The other fact is that during a wiretapped conversation, she said nothing that incriminated her. After the judgments, Chelsea started crying profusely as friends and family comforted her. During the trial, the judge had ruled some crown evidence relevant to establishing motive was inadmissible. Uh, we felt we presented a, a strong case and argued for conviction for manslaughter and 
The judge did not agree with us, so we're disappointed today. The judge says she believes Withby did something to her son, but added that she couldn't convict on probably guilty and that some other interference could have happened to the boy. Oh, well, obviously we're pleased with the result. It was something we were hoping for and hopefully expecting, so it's just a matter of now, you know, Chelsea's got to decide. You know what she's going to do from here. Her life's been on hold for three years, so it's just going to be a matter of kind of moving forward from here. The Crown has 30 days to appeal. As Withby walked out of court surrounded by friends and family, she continued to clutch onto the teddy bear she has held from the start of the trial. It should also be noted, however, that Chelsea's mother, Lisa Virtue, was friends with the judge who was on the case. And it was said that she was even seen out during the trial having coffee with the judge. There have also been other people online who have claimed that Chelsea has a drinking problem and could be neglectful towards her son, especially when it came to having men over her apartment. So take that as you will. Emerson Whippy's private memorial service was held on Tuesday, June 16th, 2020 at Spears Funeral Chapel in Regina and he was then buried. Well, thank you for listening to Emerson's story today. This is so incredibly sad, not only that this poor little boy suffered, but also because nobody was punished for his death, when it was very clear that his injuries were not just an accident. Something had to have happened to Emerson while he was in his mother's care. Those type of major injuries don't happen from a baby falling out of a crib or hitting his head on a rocking chair. It also seems incredibly convenient that her mother was friends with the judge and that her boyfriend took himself out of this world after Chelsea didn't want him speaking with police. But what do you think? So if you like true crime and you want to hear it from me, then don't forget to hit that subscribe button below and turn on your notifications too so you'll know when I upload a new video, which is at least twice every week. And don't forget to check out my new merch store as well. Thanks for watching A Wicked World today. Until next time, guys, take care. Bye. Thank you to all the patrons of A Wicked World. Now, there's even more of A Wicked World on Patreon. So check it out at patreon.com slash a wicked world or use the Patreon app. You'll have access to exclusive videos each month and more. Any support truly helps to make sure the victims never get forgotten and to highlight the shortcomings of society associated with each case. Do you have a suggestion for a case you'd like to see me cover? If so, send me an email at awickedworldtruecrime at gmail.com.